All right. Wonderful. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you today. I was at the um, conference, was it in Las Vegas last year? NASJA and NACOM combined and spoke at that time, and there were some NACOM members who were present. So if there's any familiar faces here, I'm sure I'll make them out as the lights begin to raise up a little bit. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. How many folks here? I'm just going to ask from New Mexico. Anyone from New Mexico? Vermont? Texas? All right, for Texas. Um, Nebraska? Washington State? Washington, D.C.? California? Nevada? All right, those are the states I've covered within the last, I think, um, 18 months. Um, so it's really um, a pleasure to be here and um, really a joy to be here and to be having an opportunity to speak with people who are leading our justice system. Um, one of the things we're going to do is try to be very interactive. I'm going to apologize in advance because we're going to be talking about some technical terms. Uh, I will not ask you to spell any of them, but, but I will ask you to at least understand and um, memorize their meaning, so to speak. To get us started, I'm just going to show you a couple of the key areas that we will be dealing with, if you'll indulge me here. We're going to be talking about the brain, and in so doing, we're going to be having a discussion um, in, in fairly large part about the prefrontal cortex, the PFC. We'll be talking about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, so we'll be having a grand old time. And that area is right towards the front there, all right, that frontal lobe. We're also going to play around a bit with some other important areas. That spot, that blue spot right there is called the amygdala. We'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about the insula. We'll be talking about the parietal lobe. All right? Once again, it will not be necessary for you to be able to spell any of these. That's always the biggest, most difficult component of it for me. However, what we want to do is gain power over what's going on inside of our own brains. And we cannot do that unless and until we are able to understand what's going on inside of our brains. More importantly, or perhaps just as importantly, we must understand what's going on inside of the brains of those who we are leading and serving every day. Without that understanding, we are writing things off to personality clashes, to um, strange behavior, to sociopolitical phenomena, and it's more than that. We're going to go from the macro into the micro and hopefully at the end of this session give you some worthwhile ideas on, and tools on how to solve problems that we thought just lived in our imagination, perhaps. Now to do that and to do that effectively and also for my own personal entertainment, we need to play some games. All right? All right. So here's what we got to do. If you have something in front of you that's like water or a booklet or something, if you could push that away, we're going to do some stuff that requires both your attention and the use of your hands. Okay. Of the folks who are in here, has it, is anyone who's in here actually been in a class with me before? A couple? All right, wonderful. So you can laugh when this part starts. All right, here's how we're going to do this. The first part of the game, the first game, is a word match game. A word will appear in the center, categories on either side. The category on one is female, on the other side we've got male. The words that will appear in the center will relate to the, either the category female or male for this first segment. Fair enough, all right? Here's the conundrum. I need you to categorize those words quickly and accurately, but you need to let me know how you're categorizing them, so we need an audible cue, we like to call it. I need you to decide, as a group, if the word that appears in the center relates to the concept female, do you want to hit the table with two hands or do you want to clap? Clap. I know this is a difficult decision. You might want to go into caucus around it or something like that. No, oh, no, you're okay. All right, all right. So we're going to actually clap for female and we're going to hit the table with two hands for male. Fair enough. Complex so far. You got this. All right. All right. But let's practice. To increase our level of competence and competency, let's practice. All right. So female, male. Female, male. Female, male. Okay, now I'm going to give you a try. I'm going to go quickly. Let's see how you do. Ready, go. Well, 
Well done. Well done. What have we proven thus far? On a neurophysiological level, we've proven that you're all literate. Okay, that's all right. That's, that's, that's stage one. Okay, next we have to go to another word matching game, categories being career and family. Career and family. Words will appear in the center just as rapidly as before. If the word that appears in the center relates to the concept career, you will. There you go. And if it relates to family? Career? Family. Career? Family. Career? Family. Let's go. There's a few more polysyllabic words thrown into that one. Not as many sight words, but you all did okay overall. You did okay. But we can't stop there. And the groaning. I love the groaning. All right. So see, any, any good academician likes to hear the audience groan when they begin some component of the work. All right. So here's what we've got. We've got the same words that you've seen before in a new randomized order. If those words relate to either the concept female or career, you will clap. If they relate to the concepts male or family, you will hit the table. Fair enough? Let's practice, why don't we? <laughs> female or career? Male or family. Female or career? Male or family. Female or career? Male or family. Right, nice and fast. Let's go. All right, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. That's okay, that's okay. One of the courses I teach at the National Judicial College um, is actually a four-day long course that's team taught on ethics and courtroom dynamics. And there's a large section um, of time spent on the neuroscience components. And half of the people who come to this course come to gather information for their respective jurisdictions. And the other half come because they've been disciplined by their judicial commissions. <laughs> it's a tough crowd, trust me. And we get to this point and they start doing this part of the test and that's when all the arms get folded in the front two rows. And so, so I'm really happy to be here with a group of individuals who are fully participating. All right, we're gonna do one more. And then we're gonna do another exercise that goes even more quickly, but we're gonna finish up this one. Same words you've seen before in a new randomized order. If the words that appear in the center relate to the concept male or career, you will clap. If they relate to female or family, male or career, female or family. Male or career, female or family. Male or career, female or family. Let's go. Good. have more difficulty on, in your opinion, set three or set four? Set three or set four, which one more difficulty? Three, four, set three. I heard a lot more difficulty on set three, particularly even with the, words theme, with the words family and career. When the word family appeared in the center on set three, there was difficulty matching that with male and family. When the word career appeared in the center in set three, there was difficulty matching that with the concept female and career. Who do you think has more difficulty on set three versus set four, men or women? Oh, just indicted the entire male group, just like that. <laughs> Actually, women. Yes, men don't do well either. <laughs> they don't, typically. But women, even women with careers outside of the home, have a little bit more difficulty than their male counterparts. 
completing that third set accurately. Let's, I'll explain how it all works in a second. Let's take one more. This one has pictures. We like pictures. And uh, therefore, it goes much more quickly. Stick with me. Let's see if we get good resolution. There we go. All right. Picture will appear in the center. If the picture relates to the concept black, you clap. Concept white, you hit the table. Black, white. Black, white. Black, white. Now, allow me to pause for a moment and take this time to give a special note to those in the last three rows who do not have tables in front of them and <laughs> may be under the impression, for whatever reason I won't attempt to guess, that perhaps you do not need to participate in this portion of the exercise. I have a workaround for you. I'm a giver. Here's what we need you to do. If you have something on your lap, go ahead and put it down and hit your lap and then clap. We won't be able to hear the lap hitting as much as we hear on the tables, but we will be able to hear the clapping pretty well. Fair enough? And there's some chairs up here. You know, whenever people say that, they feel so self-conscious about walking up in the front. But somebody, some bold individual, some A-type personality is going to eventually come and take these chairs for us. Yes, sir. There's three right here in the front if anyone would like. I don't want anyone to get tired. And a couple over here. Okay. Here we go. So black, white. Ready? You're going to see a series of pictures. Ready, go. Almost a perfect score. Excellent, excellent. Word match time, here we go. Word will appear in the center if the word relates to the concept good, you will clap. If it relates to the concept bad, you will hit the table. I put a sample word in. I put a sample word in because my primary audience for education is typically judges who are typically former litigators or actual attorneys. And a lot of litigators are not aware of the fact that agony is a bad word. <laughs> As a former litigator myself in practice for many years, I can attest to the fact that that's not something that's always told to us in our larger law firms, Fortune 500 clients type, etc. So, agony would be an, a bad word. Butterflies and flowers will be our good words, all right? <laughs> so, good, bad, good, bad. Good, bad. Let's go. Excellent. That was almost 100% of the room. Why don't I have something in the center here? Because it's going to mix together with the pictures, good, and, and, and the pictures and the words, I should say. It's a little discombobulating when it switches from the pictures and the words, but it's the words you've already seen and the pictures you've already seen all mixed in together. Okay? If the word or the picture that appears in the center relates to the concept black or good, you will. White or bad, black or good, white or bad. Black or good, white or bad. Black or good, white or bad. Let's go. Don't give up. <laughs> Don't give up. All right, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Shake it off. That was better than the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. Okay, switching. You knew it was coming. White or good in one corner, black or bad in the other. Same picture, same words in a new randomized order. If the concept or if the word or the picture relates to the concept white or good, you black or bad, white or good, black or bad, white or good, black or bad. This is the last one. Let's bring it home, folks, and then we're all neuroscience all the time. Okay, ready, go. Always end with a joke. Good job, good job, good job. Okay, here's what this all meant. What you just took was a simulated version 
of a test called the IAT, the Implicit Association Test. How many people have heard of that test before? A few, wonderful. The IAT is a test out of Harvard. You can actually take it online. You don't sit in front of the computer and hit the table and clap. You don't, really, no. <laughs> kind of like a Wii game where you're moving around. Nothing like that at all. No, you hit the E or the I key. And it measures two separate things as you're doing it on the computer. So to categorize, instead of clapping, you'd hit the E key. Instead of hitting the table, you'd hit the I key. And it measures two things. First, it measures in milliseconds how much longer it takes you to categorize for one group or another. And second, it measures how many mistakes you make. So it measures that hesitation when you were about to hit the table, but you pulled up at the last minute and you clapped. And it measures when you hit the table, you said, man, I didn't mean to hit the table. It gets both of those. 4.8 million people, 4.8 million people have taken the implicit association test online and had their data recorded. That's what we call statistically significant sample. All right? And in so doing, we've gathered a fair amount of information. Um, people who have been paying attention to the studies have gathered a fair amount of information on what we call implicit association or unconscious bias, as a layperson term that's often used. What could I mean by implicit? This is interactive, folks, and I'm a real old professor. I can wait a long time, just amazingly long, and I can just stare like Barbara Walters at everybody until someone raises. Implied, what do we mean by that, implied? Suggested, okay. Unspoken? Unspoken to whom? Unspoken to whom? Something that's in you that you don't even realize it's in you, but it shows up. Something your environment around you has put into place. So all of those answers are correct, okay? Unspoken perhaps even to yourself, not discussed as well, and something internal that you may not be aware of, okay? And something that is implied as opposed to obvious, all right? Implicit association. The other terminology that's used from time to time is implicit bias and implicit preference, okay? And we'll be exploring that. Now, if the only conversation that we have is around whether or not we hit the table or clap, quickly and accurately in all such categories, this would be the end of the inquiry, but we can't stop there. The implicit association test is available online. It has numerous different categories. You can take the category for religion. You can take the one for um, gender and science. You took the gender career one. There's one for gender and science that's very similar. There's one for age. The highest level of implicit bias shown is on the test for age. Instead of black and white, it's old and young, and then good and bad, the exact same words but pictures of older people and pictures of younger people. And the level of implicit bias is frightening. People's difficulty with matching the concepts that come in the center when the conversation is old and good and young and bad, they fall apart. They just can't seem to get the matching correct. So this is, these are things that we need to discuss because they, if they live in our unconscious mind, we're not going to have control over them. And when we talk unconscious mind, that seems nice and, you know, kind of vague. We need to get more precise. We need to talk about our brain. And having that discussion requires us to understand a little bit of the science here. This is an MRI machine. How many people here have had an MRI before? Ooh, a lot of folks, a lot of folks. All right. An MRI is not a comfortable thing to have. It can be noisy. You can feel claustrophobic, correct? The MRIs that you have at the hospital are imaging or scanning the internal organs of the body or the structure of your body from the inside. We're going to be talking about fMRIs, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So instead of simply looking at the structure, we want to look at how the structure is functioning. We want to look at something called activation. The movement of hydrogen and, indeed, more importantly, oxygen from one part of the body to another. In the context of the brain, we want to look at the movement of oxygen from one part of the brain to another. We want to know where the oxygen is going and where it is leaving. Two important components. And we want to know what makes that happen. 
once we understand the phenomena, why it's happening, then we can begin to gain some level of control over that process. So they put people inside of the MRI machine and they scan their brains and they come up with all kinds of different studies and we'll be discussing those studies. And what they want to understand is why we make the decisions that we make. Who can tell me what they think is the one critical thing that we need to make a decision? At the very beginning of the process, other than having a brain, um, what, what do we need actually to make a decision? Information, knowledge. At my front row here is just going to get candy like all day long. <laughs> information and knowledge. In the context of a computer, information and knowledge would be considered data, and there would be a place that that data would be stored, correct? In the context of the, of the brain, we're going to talk about the memory. Because if your data collection methodology is flawed, your decision making will be flawed as well. So we've got to look at the memory. The memory lives primarily, though not exclusively, in the land of the hippocampus. And we're going to take a peek at a question first. What will affect our ability to accurately recall someone's SAT scores? A, the person's gender, B, the person that person's ethnicity, or C, the way which, in which the person communicates with us to demonstrate his or her intelligence. Who thinks A, gender? SAT scores, no, gender, no, ethnicity, B, one or two takers, no, no, C, communication methodology, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Except they wouldn't have published the study if that was what was really going on. And I probably wouldn't have made a slide for a diversity-related class, right? We've got to go ahead and look at the other two options, so here's what this is. The Harvard study on identity cues. Harvard study on identity cues. This is where the Harvard bias comes out. So my implicit and maybe not so implicit biases against Harvard are going to be bubbling up now. And you can write all of your letters of complaint straight to the NACOM board. Don't send them to me. All right? So here's what they did. They took a group of Harvard undergrads. They bring them into a room one by one, and they're going to have them have an email conversation with the person in the room next door who they've never met. An email conversation, OK? To have that email conversation, they give them email addresses to use to reach the person in the room next door, not for themselves, not their own email address, but this is the way they're going to reach the person in the room next door. They're going to even have, it's hard to read up on the screen, um, chin, C-H-E-N, at wjh.harvard.edu. Some of them are going to get that. And some of them are going to get Amy, A-M-Y, at wjh.harvard.edu. So chin and Amy, all right? And they're going to have an email conversation. The person in the room next door is an underpaid graduate student who is running a script. They've been told to give certain information out in a certain order and to ask certain questions and keep the conversation going according to a script. They finish the conversation, and they do a 10-minute long distraction task. In the midst of that conversation, of course, the, uh, the underpaid graduate student is told to reveal a certain math and verbal SAT score. Okay. The people who are participating in the study, the undergrads who are participating in the study, have no idea that some of them got the email address Chin to reach the other person, and some of them got the email address Amy. They don't think that that's part of the study, OK? Because they're bought in one by one. All right, fair enough. So they have this email conversation. They do a little puzzle distraction task, get their minds off of everything. The experimenters come back into the room and say, what do you remember from your conversation? What do you remember in terms of the math SAT score that you were told? And what do you remember in terms of the verbal? So I ask you. For the math SAT score, did the people who had the email address chin to reach the person in the room next door, remember the math score as higher, lower, or the same as what they were told 10 minutes ago? What about Amy? Higher, lower, or the same? Oh, the cynics. That's right. This is an average. People who used the email address Chin remembered the uh, math score as higher repeatedly and consistently. Some eight or nine points higher, some one or two points higher, but higher. People who used the email address Amy to reach the person in the room next door remembered the, email, remembered the math score as lower. Some just two or three points lower, some seven or eight points lower, but repeatedly and consistently remembering it lower. These are averages. What's going to happen with verbal?
There you have it. Same people who were using Amy previously and remember the, the math score is lower, remember the verbal score is higher, significantly higher. Once again, this being an average. And the same people who remember Chen as having higher math scores than what they were told, remember Chen as having lower verbal scores. 10 minutes later. I didn't tell you something. When the study began, all of the participants were informed that they were about to have an email conversation with an Asian American woman by the name of Amy Chin. What do we think of that? Any ideas? Why did that happen? Yes. They didn't associate Amy with being Asian American, even though they knew that this was an Asian American woman by the name of Amy Chin. Is it that they didn't associate her with being Asian American, or something else was going on? What was going on? They focused on the first name for Amy because that's the one they were using most frequently. And what did Amy signal to them? Female. Female. European, perhaps. But it distracted them from the Asian component, Asian American component of the conversation, possibly, correct? Or made them focus on that aspect of her. Because I submit to you that it was not simply replacing Asian with European, but focusing on the female component and then activating the template for women don't do well in math. Okay? Thinking about this for a moment. Now, I submit to you the following. Do you collect in your daily time at work more than two numbers? in terms of the data you bring in? Probably. These folks were asked to remember two three-digit numbers that they cared about. Because don't you think it's strange when having a conversation with someone you've never met before in your life, don't you think it's strange when they share with you their math and verbal SAT scores? Don't, that's just weird, isn't it? They asked the Harvard undergrads afterwards, they asked them, didn't you think this was strange? Did this stand out for you? And they said, no, what's wrong with that? You know, you've got to get to know people. Tell them your math and verbal SAT scores because it's Harvard undergrad. So that's, they had to check for that. Actually, two people said they thought it was strange. They took those two people out of the study. <laughs> All right. So this was not information that necessarily stood out. But they were being asked to remember two three-digit numbers. 10 minutes after they were told, and these numbers had meaning for them. They could place them in context. And the original information that they were provided with, that this was Amy Chin, an Asian American woman, was trumped by the template that was placed in their mind based on the fact that one part of her identity was enhanced over the other. It's called misremembering, folks. In the context of leadership, as we look at individuals who are performing, overperforming or underperforming, do we remember later on who is under, overperformed or underperformed? Do we look at statistical information and analysis and recall the numbers slightly differently? Think about this for a moment. I was giving um, a lecture to the um, National Council of uh, Appellate Court Chief Justices, State Chief Justices. And, um, uh, one of the conversations we were having is that it does, it's not required that you misremember every single fact. It's not. Just every fifth fact, every tenth fact, until you get to the end of a lengthy or arduous or complex decision-making process and the decision you make at the end is skewed because your data collection methodology is inherently flawed. And lucky for you, it's unconscious. So you're completely unaware of the fact that this has even occurred. That's what we need to unravel. That's the phenomena that we need to unravel in part. Let's assume that we can fix the data collection methodology by understanding the reason that the brain places these templates into play as we make decisions. 
and how that works itself out. Part of that reasoning is based on this notion of survival. And back in the day, we would walk around in the so-called jungle, and we'd see one another meet up with people. And we couldn't ask somebody for their CV or their resume, social security number, things of that nature to do a proper background check. We grunted at them, and they grunted back. Okay, And I think I just lost something there. Um, and as we went through this particular process, we realized that the best way to go about these things is to actually just assess the face, determine if indeed the individual was friend or foe, and move on from there. Now there was a group of people who had what we call a low level amygdala activation. The amygdala activates when we feel fear, anxiety, or distrust. They saw faces that were unfamiliar to them. They had a low level amygdala, amygdala activation. They sat around, they said, you know, you seem friendly enough. I'm not scared of you. I see you and I'm not frightened. I'm not having any anxiety issues. Let's talk. Many of those people got eaten, okay? They didn't live long enough to have progeny, etc. And so, you know, we moved on from them. Then there's those people in the middle, those people who said, I'm going to reason this out. I'm going to think this through. I, I see you and I don't have an immediate fear reaction due to whatever I've been told in my particular tribe or lack of familiarity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit around and I'm going to explore the possibilities with you. Eventually, those people got eaten too. Okay? Because they, eventually they're going to come up on somebody who's going to actually try to kill them, right? This is, this is back in the cave person days. Check my PC cave person terminology. You like that? <laughs> I'm growing every day. All right. Then there's group number three. Group number three came up on a stranger in the jungle and said, Hey, you don't look familiar. You're not from my tribe. I don't really know you. You know what? I'm out of here. Those folks lived to reproduce and we are their progeny, okay? And anthropologically speaking, we have some of these reactions out of a sense of survival. Back in the day before there was internet and all this dogma and discussion about the global age and a global society and all that conversation, okay, before all of that, we were struggling with just how to make it. Now we're trying to cooperate with a brain that has been pre-programmed to run, hide, or fight if people fit a particular template. And minimally, if not that, to make a shortcut, even with regard to our memory. So here's what they did. They had amygdala activation um, studies, and they put people inside of fMRI machines, and they flashed pictures. In one such study, they flashed pictures of African-American males, and then they flashed pictures of Caucasian males. People are lying there and the pictures are being flashed. And they want to see if there's a differential level of amygdala activation as they flash those pictures. Well, what do you think they found? More for the African-American male or more for the Caucasian male? And I'll also take questions. Yes? Well, what was it? What's the sample? What's the sample? And I got another question. What was the nationality of the people who were being tested? Um, was there an envelope right around here? Did you see one? Maybe that table back. Yeah, could you open that up for me, please? Thank you. Read it nice and loud if you could. All right, did everybody hear that? No. All right, that was good though. Someone will ask Kimberly about the race of the participants whose brains were scanned. Signed, Kimberly. <laughs> but thank you, I didn't pay either of you two to ask that question. I know that that question is going to be asked. I've given over 100 lectures nationwide and internationally, and I know that question is going to be asked. The New Zealand judges asked it two weeks ago. That question is going to be asked, and I know it's going to be asked because it's the quintessential question. It's the question that we cannot go forward with until we, we answer that. We really don't know what to do with the study until we answer that question. And it tells me something. It tells me that before we walked into this room, we knew that what group we come from will affect 
how we react to other groups. So the answer is that these paragons of diversity, these extraordinary luminaries in the area of neuro neuroscience and social psychology, these absolute heroes in the context of implicit bias, put only white people in the machine. We're working on them. You see the disconnect there. We're working on them. We're working on them. Okay. But this great group of individuals, they put a group of Caucasian people inside of, the, inside of the machine, one after the other, and they scan their brain. And we're actually having conversations now about how to diversify that crew for one of the upcoming studies, hopefully. So we'll see. And here's what they found. They found that there was a higher level of amygdala activation for the African-American male face versus the Caucasian face, and that did not surprise them. Here's what surprised them. What surprised them was the level of amygdala activation correlated directly with people's scores on the implicit association test for race, the simulated version of which we took at the beginning of this class. So as people had increasing difficulty on that set that said black and good and white and bad, their level of amygdala activation was higher when they saw the African-American male face, corresponding to their level of implicit bias on the race IAT. Is this disquieting at all? It shouldn't be. It should be empowering. Not initially, it's going to take some time. The most difficult people to teach fairness to are people who value fairness the most. I'll say it again. The most difficult people to teach fairness to are people who value fairness the most. Why? Say again. You're in denial. They think they're fair. People who care about fairness will find it painful as they go through the discovery process that there is implicit bias and they may hold it. The next level of pain is to recognize that those biases may manifest themselves in their day-to-day -day decision making. And if you did not find that to be uncomfortable, it may indeed be an indication that you don't value fairness. But I have to tell you, that's not what I see in this room. I see a lot of real uncomfortable people. So that tells us something good, and it tells us that we have an arena in which we can have this conversation and go forward to start seeking out tools of things we can do. Now here's something you really don't want to hear. You should never tell a group of people that before you tell them what they're about to know. But I'm going to tell you anyway, all right? Here's something you really don't want to hear. The power position potentiates or enhances or increases the effect of implicit bias. It increases it. What does that mean? They put two people in a dyad type situation. Okay? They tell them, you are about to have a team situation with another individual, and they give the person a picture of the individual. You got to note for a moment, though, folks, that most of these um, studies will be based on the black white dynamic, the African American Caucasian dynamic. It's because that's where the money is for the funding right now, and that's the largest population in most of the two states that people are able, and uh, most of the states, I'm sorry, across the nation, that people can pull from and at the universities where they're actually doing these studies, but we can extrapolate important information from these studies to have additional discussions about other groups. Please keep that in mind. But this one is another black-white test. And what they did is they said, OK, you, you, the participant in the study, we're going to tell you, you're going to either be on the team of two people in a superior position or a subordinate position. They take their IATs, all right? Before they tell them who they're going to be in, interacting with. Then they tell them who they're going to be interacting with. If I am Caucasian and I am interacting with an African-American person and I am told that that person is going to be in the superior position to me in the team, they're going to be the supervisor, and I am going to listen to what they have to say, my IAT score will not change from whatever it was before we started the, le the, um, the exercise. Here's what they found that was interesting, though. If I am told that I am going to be the supervisor, 
and that the person who is subordinate to me is going to be African American, my IAT score on the race IAT will increase. My level of implicit bias as demonstrated on the race IAT will go up. Why do we think that is? That 171 is a, um, uh, really what that is is the differential. We can go into a long explanation, but it's the differential, how much more difficulty people had with the set that said black and good and white and bad versus the set that said white and good and black and bad, and they subtract those numbers, and that's the differential. It was that much higher, 171, higher it, when the person was in the superior position than when they were in the subordinate position, pretty close in the subordinate position. Okay? Why do you think that is? I don't expect anyone to come up with the answer necessarily, but I'd like you to explore it in your minds. Why do you think that is? Give me some guesses. Say again? Thus need to influence. What have we been told about our leaders? I train our Gini Commission for the state of California two times a year. And the Gini Commission is, is the group, at least in, in the California context and in other states I know, where they vet the different judicial candidates. Say they're good, bad, indifferent, etc. And they talk about this notion of having been vetted, having stood the test of time, having proven one's ability to work with others, to manage things effectively, to act in an ethical way. That's what we say about our leaders, correct? And so this, is, this goes against everything that we understand. And we start talking about that notion of power and what it does and whether or not it corrupts, and that's really poetic, but I'm not sure that's a very good explanation either at all. Let me submit this to you. The amygdala is implicated in fear, threat, and anxiety. The amygdala is also implicated in aggression. Why? Ooh. <laughs> My grandmother would say, move over to the side. <laughs> Whoever that is, don't stand too close to them. Somebody's not telling the truth. Okay, right, right, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the right position here. Um, what, the notion of fear, threat, and anxiety. If you feel, feel fear, threat, and anxiety back in the days of living in the jungle, would it also be helpful for that initial idea and feeling to also make you a little more aggressive? Would it? Well, maybe. It's because it's flight or fright. Flight or fight. You might have to fight. You might have to show some superiority. The amygdala may be activated when we feel that we have to take on a certain amount of power. But our policies do not address the fact that somebody with a higher level of power may also be activating portions of their brain that may be implicated in implicit bias. Our policies don't address that because our policymakers don't study neuroscience. And because we have created a structure whereby we are to trust the fairness from the top down. All we need to have is a well-educated group of leaders who understand what to look for and anticipate it. And we will be able to begin to unravel some of these processes. I want to make sure we're able to get through all the material. So I will move on ever so quickly. Okay. Just one moment here. I want to show you this. Do facial features affect decision making? There's two articles you can pull for this if you want to. By the way, when you see my citations, sometimes I'm using the citation format for scientific journals and sometimes the legal citation format. It's just a manifestation of my own schizophrenia. Nothing you can do about it, okay? So this one I think is Harvard Blue Book. The other one goes with the Neuro Journal. Don't pay any attention, all right? But here's how this one works. They actually pulled a number of mug shots from convicted felons and they coded their faces for what they called Afrocentric facial features. <gasps> Suck your breath in and go, oh no, Afrocentric facial features. Is she going to ask me to define that? No, I'm not. 
I'm going to do it because I'm qualified. I've got this, all right? Darker skin, broader nose, fuller lips, curlier hair. Did I say cheekbones? Did I say pointed chin? Forehead size, not phenotypically bound, okay? That's what they coded for. And psychologists spend a lot of time coding faces. So they get a whole team together. There's a whole process that they use, not necessarily just Afrocentric facial features versus Eurocentric facial features, but they actually go through a process of coding facial features for all different types of things, okay? In fact, before we finish having fun with this, let's take a peek at how they do that. All right. If you could watch the lady's face very carefully in the center, very carefully. You see a difference? Here's what they did. This is the exact same woman. The same piece of hair is out of place in each of the pictures, exact same pictures. Computer program morphs her face so that her eyes are closer together in the early pictures and further apart in the later pictures. They give the pictures, the exact same pictures, with only that one facial feature manipulated to a large group of in individuals, a statistically significant sample, and they ask people to rate this individual's intelligence, competence, or normalcy. What they found is that the people who were looking at this woman down here, controlling for all other factors, found this woman to appear more normal and more competent, and that woman to appear less so up at the top. I know you guys hang out at singles bars, and you have a ruler, and you pull it from behind you, and you begin to measure the space between people's eyes, correct? Right? Is that on eHarmony? Do you get to like take the picture and like actually use it? No, I don't think so, right? These are things that happen that we don't pay attention to. We have no idea that we are using this as a measuring stick. But this is what happens now an expert witness has walked into the courtroom and they are saying that they have a significant level of technical knowledge and you take a look at them and you say, oh no, they don't look too bright. <laughs> hmm. Or they, they seem pretty competent, but what's coming out of their mouth has very little meaning. We can give people a bump up for looking a certain way and give people a bump down for looking another way. They might be able to convince us otherwise they might be able to convince us otherwise, but how many people in the room have a law degree? Raise your hand if you have a law degree in the room. You understand the concept of the burden of proof and the burden of persuasion? What if you, we shift the burden? What if someone has a more significant burden because they came in looking like they weren't too bright? Or looking like they weren't quite so normal? or looking more friendly, or looking more honest, or looking more like a criminal? Do they have to go a little bit further to prove that they are other than? Or is it easier to prove that they are exactly what we thought they were? In the context of hiring, in the context of leadership, we start talking about who's going to get the promotion, who's going to get the job, who looks like they fit. And we're not always talking about race. Some, sometimes we're talking about the space between the eyes. Unbeknownst to us. Let's not leave that land, though. Let's go back to playing with our brain. All right. They took this um, group of mug shots. There we go. They took the group of mug shots, and they also pulled the case files for 100 African-American men and 100 Caucasian men coded their faces for Afrocentric facial features. Can white people have Afrocentric facial features? Angelina Jolie? <laughs> Am I correct? Do the lips count? And they put them on a scale of one to nine, separate for the African Americans and the Caucasians. They separated them out. So Angelina Jolie would be somewhere about maybe a three or a four, okay? And someone who is Caucasian who has more Afrocentric facial features would be more like a nine. 
on the Afrocentric face, on, on, among the black people who were coded, you would have President Obama as somewhere around maybe a three, and Wesley Snipes would be somewhere around a nine, and Denzel would be right in the middle. <laughs> okay, that's how that works. So the nine is high and the one is low, okay? And then they control for all of these factors. All right, the seriousness of the primary offense, they had 11 separate factors, concurrent offenses, etc. So they were comparing apples to apples, the mitigating and aggravating factors of a crime. What puts you in jail for longer and what works against the actual sentence so that it actually reduces the sentence. They looked at all of those factors comparing apples to apples. Now they've got a study set up, they're ready to go. And what they find is that these types of issues, the seriousness of the primary, the seriousness of the concurrent offenses, the past history, etc., etc., all all make a big difference in how the people were actually sentenced. They actually do count, but something else counts as well. As people's Afrocentric facial um, features increased among the African American convicted felons, they found that those individuals received approximately seven to eight months more at each step as their facial features became more Afrocentric, as their skin became darker, as their noses became broader, as their lips became fuller, as their hair became curlier, they were spending more time in jail. So much so that having more Afrocentric facial features was the equivalent of having one additional concurrent offense. And I have taken my time to look through all the different criminal and penal codes wherever I could in the country to check and see if there was any place that said that it was appropriate and proper to consider the facial features in the sentencing decision. I can't find it. It's not there. They didn't end the inquiry there, though, because they found similar results for the Caucasian convicted felons as their noses became broader, as their skin became darker, as their hair became curlier, as their lips became broader, they were spending more time in jail. It's disturbing. But if the people in this room were not leaders in the court, managers in the court, individuals who care about the justice system enough to make a career out of it and to take a role in it that is influential and powerful and meaningful, then you could walk away, shake your head, and say, wow, that's really too bad. I really, I picked up some interesting information today. I'm going to go have a drink. Well, you can do that anyway. <laughs> Don't want to discourage that. But what can we do about it becomes the question. What can we do about it? Let me show you something. I won't do that to you. Shows the, the guidelines, so to speak. There we go. There we are. When you're engaging in the process of trying to correct for implicit biases, there are things that you can actually control. Okay? One of them is to try to utilize that portion of the brain, activate that portion of the brain that actually changes the automatic association or gets you to catch yourself. You're about to hit the table and you pull up at the last minute and you clap. And clapping is what you were supposed to do. Actually dismantling and changing the behavior at that moment. What part of the brain does that? And you need to figure out what that is and activate that part of the brain. Well, here's what they found. There are, this is, these are pictures of some brain waves. Um, and there's a couple of different studies that would use this type of graph. I liked this particular graph. It's a portion of the brain called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And then the rostral anterior cingulate cortex. Okay. And there's a response reaction that recurs to try to get you to clap instead of hit the table when you may be engaged in a biased reaction. This is actually not based on the IAT. This is based on what they call the shoot no shoot test. So instead of showing you pictures of different faces necessarily, they show you all these college co-eds and they're, hold, they're turned to the side and they're holding either a gun or a Coke can or a cell phone. And you're supposed to hit the E or the I key for either the options of shoot or no shoot. If you believe the person's holding a gun, you hit the E key, let's say, for shoot. And if you believe they're not holding a gun, you hit the I key for no shoot. Okay? All right. Here's the thing, of course. 
half of co-eds are African American and the other half are Caucasian. And what they find is that people are consistently hitting the shoot, gun, the shoot button for the African Americans who are holding the Coke cans and the cell phones. And equally as disturbing, they're hitting the no shoot button for the Caucasians who are holding the guns. Somebody is dying unnecessarily either way we go, folks. All right? That this is another type of implicit association regarding criminality as opposed to negative versus positive attribution. Thinking for a moment about this, how do you stop yourself? Well, they find that the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is the one that people usually use. Their own strong sense of values and their belief in the notion of the good and the true, and that that can sometimes help a little bit. That part of the brain wave, the DACC, can stop you sometimes from hitting the table and pull you up and make you clap. To hit the I key instead of the E key when it's appropriate. To not utilize the bias in the final decision making process. But they found that it's the rostral anterior cingulate cortex that is more effective than the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex in making you do the right thing. Resist the temptation to engage in the implicit bias behavior. Really? How do I get that rostral thing online and working for me? I like that. Let's, let's, make, let's make sure that happens. Here's the trick, my court leaders and managers. The rostral anterior cingulate cortex comes online and activates when we comes online and activates when people are under the impression that there will be a reward or a punishment for engaging in biased or preferential behavior. A reward or a punishment. A reward for avoiding the bias or a punishment or penalty for engaging in the bias. No matter how small or large, it may just be, oh, that person's going to look at me like I was biased. That person's going to know I was biased and they're going to think poorly of me. That penalty can be a beginning part of the conversation. Or the reward for engaging in unbiased behavior. Oh, look how well you're doing there. John, Sue, Angela. Only leadership can create the reward versus penalty context. That's the only way it can work. In the land where we engage in this conversation around if you didn't use the N-word, you didn't engage in racial bias. If you didn't specifically tell that particular individual that because of their gender, race, sexual orientation, age, veteran status, that you don't like them, then we can rationalize your behavior in some other way and therefore completely remove the possibility that there will be a specific, although it may be nothing more than social, penalty for your biased behavior. You see that notion? Does anyone understand that notion of removing the specter that it's got to be something else because if you didn't come in screaming and shouting about how much you dislike a particular group of people, you can't possibly be biased? Any thoughts on that? This is my professorial moment where I wait patiently again. I want to make sure nobody's confused. Some people should be at least minimally uncomfortable about the possibility of penalties and how that might work out. No one. Everyone's going to immediately put in place a penalty and reward system for implicit bias. I wait patiently. My Barbara Walters. Not frightened? Need some more detail. So let's say we're in the midst of how many people engage in hiring here? Almost everybody. All right, fair enough. You're in the midst of a hiring process. You don't want to talk about quotas because in most of the states in the union that's going to be inappropriate. All right? But you do want to have a conversation about diversity. You notice that certain individuals, whatever category they may be in, are consistently not getting in those final rounds. 
And it may not be the category that you automatically assume. It may be a completely different category. Maybe age-based, maybe sexual orientation. It may be men are not getting in certain categories where women have the stronghold, okay? But you're looking at this manifest itself and you don't say anything in the meeting. You don't bring it up. You see, there's no potential for penalty when people have been told that it is inappropriate to have these conversations. You hear someone say something that you think is inappropriate about this person's qualifications in a promotion decision. You think it might have a double meaning. It's not something anyone's going to litigate about. It's just inappropriate. But in the culture of your court, you do not bring those kinds of things up because you will have, instead of a lasting friendship, a lasting enemy if you call someone biased. How many friends do you have who you've called biased before? Not too many, I would suspect. Let me submit to you that if we were all speaking the same language, if we all knew that implicit biases came as a result of years, hundreds of years of evolution through this process, if we were receiving messages and information from the time we were infants, if we're told to be fair, and therefore by the very fact that our authority figures have implanted this importance around being fair, they have precluded us from being able to explore the possibility that we are not fair, and that the onus of responsibility attaches today. If everybody in the court had that information, could the conversation be diff different somehow? When implicit bias rises up in the conversation while somebody's looking through a resume, if you were to say, you know, is there some implicit bias that might be in play there that we as a group aren't seeing? Can that conversation be had much more, in, in a much more fruitful way if everybody knew what implicit bias meant? We've got to remove the defensiveness around it. Leadership has to take a leadership role in discussing implicit biases and then getting specific. And there are specific methodologies for dealing with that in hiring, methodologies for dealing with that with judicial decision making, supervisorial decision making, assessing people for promotions, reworking the policy inside of a court as to how the court's going to be structured, access to justice issues. It's about opening one's mind and considering different options. Now, we can't leave one portion of the discussion. We'll get to that in a moment, too. Let me show you something, if I may. It's not that slow a computer. It's just having fun doing a couple of things. I'm going to try to see if you all can hear this. And I want you to pay attention to your reaction as best you can to what you're about to see. Attend to your internal reaction to it. I should make it full screen, but I'm afraid. Let's see if I can do it. Yeah, all right, it'll work. Ready, go. Children in New York City. Can you show me the doll that you like best or that you'd like to play with? This one. I like that one. Can you show me the doll that is the nice doll? Fifteen of the 21 children prefer the white doll. Can you all hear that? Could you hear that okay? Anyone hear that okay? Did anyone know what that was at all? Or a simulation of? You guys remember the Brown versus Board of Education test? Um, exactly, and it was called the doll test. For the Brown versus Board of Education um, uh, case for the Supreme Court, the supporting scientific information was based on a doll test, a test that they gave to children who had attended segregated schools at the time, and they asked them to look at the different dolls and to say, is this doll good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant? Which one would you want to play with, more versus less? This was back in the 50s, folks, right? Okay. 
And they went through it, and they were able to prove that the African-American children who had attended segregated schools indeed had greater difficulty relegating positive attributes to the African-American dolls or African-American looking dolls than to the Caucasian looking dolls. And that they relegated very positive attributes to the Caucasian looking dolls. And when they asked, were asked which doll looked most like them, they were able to identify the African-American doll. That test was done a couple years ago, the one you just saw. Okay? So we're still seeing the same phenomena. But why am I showing you that? This isn't a course for educators necessarily, right? You're not doing K through 12 work, correct? Let me show you. And this is not just for those who are working in the juvenile courts. There we go. We need to talk about something called pain empathy as we begin to manage this leadership process. I asked you to pay attention to what you were feeling. If you could hear that, you were watching a young African-American girl, at least for the most part, there were some other children on the screen, who were selecting and giving these negative versus positive attributes. I submit to you that that was an IAT. It was a children's IAT. Which one's good, which one's bad? Which one's good, which one's bad, all right? Before the land of computers and E&I keys um, with a screen right in front where they could have done that. That was an IAT. And why I wanted you to pay attention to that is because it speaks to an issue regarding pain empathy. Our notion of self-interest is going to be intricately intertwined with how we feel about how we work inside of a community. Here's a great test they did. They took a group of hands and they showed a video with people getting poked right here in the hand with a hypodermic needle or a Q-tip. We won't go to the Q-tip part, that was a neutral conversation. They're getting poked with a hypodermic needle and a Q-tip, and they wanted to test what they call cortical spinal inhibition, the way that we engage in pain empathy. We see someone who's been hurt, and we can sometimes almost feel their pain. You know this, if you've seen, if you have a child and you see the child fall down, you go, oh, you skinned your knee. Sometimes you immediately can feel the pain. And sometimes after you've seen it so many times, you go, come on, I'll slap a Band-Aid on it. I'm over it, right? right? You see it inside of movies. You can see something horrible happen to someone in a movie and you actually stiffen up. In part from the, the tension that's created, but also because you're engaging in cortical spinal inhibition, the process of trying to push away the pain and numb the precise area of your body, numb the precise area of your body where you see that person getting injured so that you don't have as much pain, okay? And what they did is they watched this study and they saw these individuals getting poked. They wanted to see what would happen. This is what they, I should mention. They also had a purple hand, a Barney hand. They, they did the Barney thing to see if that would affect anyone in watching the hand get hit with a hypodermic needle. That, that other one is um, similar to this one, but I wanted to show you this one. What they were showing was when you see an in-group person getting poked, in-group being a person of the same race, getting poked with a hypodermic needle, you have a higher level, which is going to be the one that dips down over here, of cortical spinal inhibition, this one right here. Inhibition means it's going to go down, and you want there to be pain empathy, and you want it to go down. So this means a greater level of pain empathy for the hand that looks like ours. Okay? You have some pain empathy being shown for the Barney hand, the purple hand, and here's the lack of pain empathy shown for the hand that did not look the same. Not just right on the zero, a lack of empathy in the other direction. If we do not relate to one another as being in this together where my fate is tied to yours, and if you are being injured by bias or by a lack of access or by an unfair process, but I don't relate to your pain, my value system notwithstanding, I will not act to address that pain, at least not first, at least not as a priority, and at least not with the same kind of ferocity that I would if I felt that pain. That makes sense a little bit? So when I see that child, I can feel guilt, I can feel horror, or I can feel pain empathy. Let's deal with the horror. Insula activation. When we see unfairness in play, 
about something we care about, we can have what's called an insula activation. And it won't be based on the gravity of the situation, it'll be based on the principles. Let me show you like this. You and I are engaged in this conversation. We've never seen one another before. An experimenter, you'll be our experimenter, is going to hand you $100 and say, this stranger has $100 free money and they're going to share some component of it with you. You give me a buck. You scan my brain while this is going on because you've got enough grant money to run me through the machine. And so what you find is that I have a very strong insula activation. Because I consider your behavior to be inherently unfair. You give me 40 bucks though instead, let's say. Not a full half because it was free money to you. You're keeping 60. No insula activation to speak of. That's pretty darn fair. She doesn't know me. And she gave me 40 bucks. Free money? No problem. Insula activation. You think it's because it's $40, right? She gives you 10 cents. She says, share some component of the money with her. You give me a penny. I have the same level of insula activation that I had when she just gave me the dollar. You give me four cents, I have the same level of insula activation or lack of insula activation, one should say, as when I got the 40 bucks. Because it wasn't about the 40 bucks, it's about the fairness of the situation. The insula is the part of the brain that activates when we believe something has happened that is unfair, repugnant, aversive. It is the same part of our brain that activates when we smell rotten garbage. If we are under the impression that we are living in an unfair process, we will work mightily to either cure that process or hide from the possibility that it is unfair because no one wants to walk into, into work and get the feel that they're smelling rotten garbage. Better for us to live in denial around it than to seek to solve it unless we feel pain empathy. Unless we feel pain empathy. So we need the, the neurophysiological process to work in tandem. All of these things to come together. They had a fabulous study that showed that we can change the process of empathizing. That when we see the hand being poked, a separate study by a completely separate author, that when we see the hand being poked, we can actually get that hand to feel like it's ours. Even when the person isn't like us. But we have to make a conscious effort to see that person as being part of our process, our community. That top one shows the insula activation. When I see a person's hand being poked and I'm told, imagine that that is you. The person you're looking at is not like you. You have identified them as dissimilar from you. Imagine, though, that they are you, and the insula activates. And that's what you want. And that's what we have to try to work on. Now I'm going to do a little exercise with you. We're right on time. See if I can get it to, there we go. All right, no, you don't have to hit the table. Don't worry. Okay. Can you see that okay? All right. So you've got to work to dampen down the amygdala activation. You've got to deal with the fact that if you spot and see unfairness, you want to do something about it or hide from it and recognize that that may be the motivation of the group. And as a leader, you have to not hide from it, even though it may create an insular activation. You have to be committed to saying, if there's an unfair situation, I'm going to actually actively do something about it. When you begin to actually actively do something about it, you create the opposite reaction, which is the reward reaction. The reward reaction is the same reaction that we get when we eat chocolate. And that's why you see the proliferation of diversity committees. To make people feel better that maybe something's happening. And that's why you see the insula activation occur when three years later the diversity committee has made no difference whatsoever. Okay? So actively doing something to help. All right? Now, what are those things that you have to do? You have to begin to activate that part of the anterior cingulate cortex that's actually going to change the way people self-correct. How do you do that? Some ideas from the group. How would I put in place the possibility that I can actually be paying attention to whether or not people are engaging in implicit bias? 
or implicit bias behavior? What can I do as a leader or a manager? Or what can I advocate for among leadership? Yes. Diversity training. Diversity training, getting everybody having the same conversation. Something else? Thank you. Point it out. That's an individual to individual or in a group setting. Okay? And if people... <laughs> Point it out. Absolutely. Now that's when something has happened. Those are two very good suggestions. Excellent. Who has a third? I will make a proposal to you. Two proposals called self-auditing. A systemic self-audit and an individual self-audit. Okay? If the system is under the impression, and some district attorney's offices have undertaken this process um, and, and say that it is indeed helpful, if the system itself is under the impression that every three months there will be a clerk who will be dedicated to pulling a certain number of cases randomly from a file and taking the name of the judge and the name of the defendant and the attorneys, if need be, off of a case, redacting it, and sending that, that's a very short process because we're talking about 20 cases probably, right? And sending that to another clerk who then will engage in a data entry process, race, age, socioeconomic status, if, it, if available, of the defendant, concurrent offenses, primary offenses, aggravating, all the stuff that you saw on that, um, on that Afrocentric facial feature study, it's about 11 separate categories. You just create a template and put that information in. 20 cases, randomly selected from numerous different judges. No one's being targeted. And after about maybe three quarters, you will have, what, about 60 cases or so. And then there's a committee that's designed to take a look at what this random sampling produced. And it's going to happen every three months. It's going to happen every three months. And every other, you know, we're going to do criminal, we're going to do felony this time out, and then the next time out we're going to go and do civil. If there's a way to do family, there's you create a different template, et cetera. Is there a way to look at some of the small claims cases, perhaps even the traffic cases, things of that nature. And do the random sampling. If you are a judge sitting in a process, and you are under the impression that the random sampling is going to occur, but you are not having a situation where you are going to have an activation that's going to make you so anxiety prone because they're using your name, right? You just know that things are going to be looked at. The part of your anterior cingulate cortex that believes that there will be a punishment or a reward will begin to activate. Without a great deal of loss to the system or to the individual. You already know the scary parts about this. I don't have to let them out to you. You guys know the part, right? Then it gets out and there's a public information request, right? I'm your lawyer now. There's a public information request <laughs> and people want to know. Here's the interesting thing about it. With the right communication department, you can talk about this as a proactive step. And by the way, you'll find things that you did not anticipate, like the age and level of experience of the judge will make a big difference. If you don't want to try that, you take educational courses and you include hypotheticals in the courses that actually will serve as a self-audit of the judges before they come in the door where they don't even know ahead of time that half of the room has been given a Latino defendant and the other half of the room has been given an Asian American defendant with the exact same case in play. Figure out what's going on and spend the rest of the class talking about how to do something about that. There's always kinds of ways to run self-audits from a systemic point of view and then to encourage other people to engage in self-audits on their own. How does that work? To actually tell the judge, and I created sheets for certain judges in, uh, in different states, here's your sheet. Go back and with your clerk track the last 20 aggravated assault cases with an individual who was between the ages of 18 and 24 for a second offense. You can find 20 aggravated assault cases with a person who's eight, between the ages of 18 and 24 for a second offense. Half of one ethnicity, half of another ethnicity. Oh, you can do boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. Is there a disparity in your sentencing decisions, the ones that have gone to trial, not the settlements? You find a difference. And when the person's under the impression that there's a monitor in the room, be it themselves or the system that brings the part of the brain online that we want to have activated, 
We get empathy in play by beginning to talk about the group as a whole. That's leadership coming into the, into the recognition that we have to see ourselves as intimately connected. And the only way to do that is to begin to realize and believe that our brains aren't doing that already. Now we gotta fix the last part of it, which is the motivation and the disconnect. Let me see if my pointer works. It does, looky, okay. Here we go, folks, this is the last section. All I need you to do for me, if you will be so kind, is to read the words. Yeah, I know it's difficult, but stick with me. We got about five minutes, ready, go. Once again, proving your literacy, I am so proud. All right, now you're gonna tell me the colors. The colors, not the words, the colors. Ready, go. That was so good. That was so good. You knew it was coming. You knew. <laughs> See, because we're family now. We know. Kimberly tries to trick people. You guys got this. Okay. Reading the words, pay no attention to the colors whatsoever. Reading the words. Ready, go. Well executed. Now give me the color. Pay no attention to the word whatsoever. Just tell me the color. Ready, go. What happened? What happened? This is a learned group of individuals. This is, this is a learned group of individuals. I refuse to abandon you all. If, if you could be so kind as to shake it off, take a deep breath in. See, that's the Berkeley in me. Now the New York in me wants to just go ahead and torture you through this process. So, okay, we're gonna go just as fast as before. Tell me the color, not the word. Second try, folks. Color, not the word. Ready, go. All right, that was the Stroop test, all right, created by Dr. Stroop in the 1920s at some point, and um, indeed it is the uh, precursor to the Dahl test, and it's the precursor to the IAT. It's based on the principle of automaticity. You can no longer get tenure at a major university doing research on the Stroop test or on the IAT. It's a been there, done that area of science, okay? However, if you're really tricky and you get some grant funding, you can, a la Emeril Lagasse, kick it up a notch, okay? And these folks decided they were going to scan people's brains while doing that last section on the Stroop test, where everybody always messes up. Here's the brain scan. This is, this red dot is the part of the brain called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the DLPFC, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex that we discussed at the beginning. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex houses what we call the rules. The rules are as follows. Women or female is home. Male is career. Black is bad, white is good. Amy is good at verbal. Chin is good at math. The rules are who's a criminal and who's not. Who looks normal in the face and who doesn't. Who is more versus less qualified. Those are the rules and they're housed in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The rule that was tested here was the rule that the word B-L-U-E, those letters in that configuration, equals blue. And if I paint it yellow and I tell you to say yellow, it doesn't matter because you're thinking blue. There's no socio-political charge to it whatsoever. It has no meaning when you go into the voting booth. It's just say blue versus say yellow. And the rule in your head is that it's blue. And the rule that I told you to apply was yellow. It was just as fair as the other rule. I said name the color. And you were incapable of doing it on both the first and the second try after you reached a certain point. Here's why. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which houses the rules, first dipped down, yellow, blue, orange, black. First it dipped, and you guys were okay on the first three um, words at the beginning. Notice that? 
Then it began to activate. Green, purple, yellow, red. As you received more information that indicated that the rule that you were utilizing to name the word was inappropriate, inapplicable, and invalid, you held more tightly to the rule. You received information, evidence if you'd like to call it that, that the rule you were utilizing was invalid, it was not working, you were failing as a group, and you could not relinquish the rule. And you had no emotional connection to the rule, and it was not based on your um, survival or otherwise. There was no pain empathy related to the rule. It was just the rule. I see the sight word blue, B-L-U-E, I think blue. And I say blue out loud. It is the changing of those rules that occurs through the diversification of our court system. It is the changing of the rules that occurs when our leadership decides that it is going to pay attention to implicit bias. And even if the faces inside of the court don't change, the hearts and minds do. It is the changing of the rules that can only occur when we realize we've got the rules in the first place. And they're being applied every single day in small ways. Every tenth decision, a few points to the left, or a few points to the light, right, a la Amy Chin. It affects our data collection and our memory. It affects who we see as scary and who's a good fit and who's normal and who's smart and who's part of the team and who's on the outside. Way over here, off of the chart, after you've been inundated with information that proves that the rule is invalid, inapplicable and inappropriate, after people have taken the Stroop test 20 times, they're tired and they're irritated, but they've taken the Stroop test 20 times. Eventually, a portion of your brain called the basal ganglia activates. And it flips the rule. It takes education of the kind that feels as if there's a billion studies coming at you one after the other, like you've taken the Stroop test 20 times to begin to flip the rule. It takes the leadership stepping in and having the courage of their convictions to say, no, I think implicit bias might be in play here. It takes changing the way we react to the possibility of implicit bias and activating portions of our brain that are worth activating. The basal ganglia steps in and says the first thing we have to do is flip the rule. And then you start saying yellow. I submit to the people in this room, as leaders and managers in the court, that you are the basal ganglia. You are perfectly primed and perfectly positioned to begin to change the rules, to flip the process as it currently stands. There are specific tools. If anybody wants to know any more about some of the solution sets that we utilize in specific situations, I'm happy to share that. My information is available. But more importantly, the first thing that must begin is the willingness to have the discussion and the dialogue and to make sure the information gets spread throughout your system so that people are actually willing to begin to change the way we think. We have to change hearts, we have to change minds, and eventually we've got to change brains. So I want to thank you for the time that you've put, spent here with me together, and I'll be available for questions. Thank you.